So today, I think this one's a little bit more emotion-based. It's going to be a little less analytical. We started talking about sort of this idea of underachievement. I remember you being the most delightful, talked about kid, like when we would go pick you up from preschool. But then I realized somewhere along the way, and that really shifted when you went to school, the way people perceived you and the way that you were being talked about and what was happening really shifted. I knew first, second grade felt very overwhelming, but I think third grade was when it really started shifting for me. It just became untenable. As an adult, I can look back and say, oh, this was an attempt to help fix the symptoms, but the way they were presented to me, it felt like I had to fix me. All I needed to hear was, you are perfect just the way you are. And if they don't like you, then they can go fuck themselves. Hello, Megan. Hello, Michelle. Welcome to Sisters. Sisters. There were never such devoted sisters. sisters. Hello. Good to Hello. see you there, love. How's good it to going? See you. It's good as always. I'm with oh. you. <laughs> so much fun. So today, as every day, we usually bring up something, a little, little tidbit, a little discuss some, some. a little, little topic. Then we kind of like dig into that brain of yours and look at that neuro spicy, neuro fabulous, neuro distinct, and specifically the ADHD-ness of your brain recently. Mm-hmm. There's a whole bunch of things inside that brain here. So at some point we'll, we'll move into other areas, but the ADD, ADHD is what we've been focusing on. It's and cavernous, then- Michelle. <laughs> cavernous. <laughs> And then we like to look at some strategies, right, that sometimes help you with yeah. some things. And then like shout out to our community to find out, do they have any help? Because we are yeah. in desperate need of it at all times. Yeah. And our community continues to grow. It's exciting. It's so exciting. Yeah. I know. And I hear it from friends when they're so listening. Cool. Yeah. I love One it. One of my friends came up and was like, we were at a staff meeting and they're like, oh, I feel like I'm with somebody famous. I just heard you on my car radio. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So that's so fun. Okay, so today I think this one's a little bit more emotion-based potentially, right? It's going to be a little less analytical. And what was interesting to me the other day, I was saying, hey, I kind of want to deep dive into the emotions. And you're like, oh, finally. (laughs) Like that I can handle. That's so easy for me. The rest of this has been torturous. I'm like, I'm so sorry. So what I wanted to kind of bring up was I remember when you were about maybe like three or four. Uh And I remember you being the most delightful talked about kid like when we would go pick you up from preschool because I'm about seven years older than you Mm -hmm. all the teachers were just glowing about your creativity and how amazing you were and they just loved you so much and I mean there were moments right where you were a little hyper but (laughs) they loved you so much now I think preschool teachers are a special group so we can give them a little shout out because like amazing that they can be with the little children all day long seriously but then I realized somewhere along the way and I was kind of off to college and coming back and that really shifted when you went to school Mm. that the way people perceived you and the way that you were being talked about and what was happening really shifted and so today I kind of wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about what it felt like to go from being what I consider to be very high achieving I don't know if preschoolers can be very high achieving but I felt like you were they all thought you were so brilliant to then being put in a situation where you felt what I can only imagine was sort of the opposite. Yeah. I mean, I don't really remember a lot from that time period as far Mm. as like how I physically felt. I know that like I've been told a lot about like how I had a light in my eyes and then the light just sort of diminished. So I could, I could probably tell you how it felt having that diminished light. And then sort of when I kind of got out of it. When do you remember like how far back? I mean, do you have this sense of remembering that you felt like you weren't achieving whatever was being asked of you? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. And when did that sort of start for you that you remember it? Let's see. Mrs. Campista, Mm -hmm. which would have been what, like second or third grade? Mm -hmm. Third grade. Yeah. 
Yeah, I want to say third grade is kind of when I really started to realize it. I mean, I knew first, second grade felt very overwhelming. That's kind of like the sense that I have from it. But I think third grade was when it really started shifting for me. It just became untenable. What did it feel like? What was happening that it became untenable? It just felt like there were these tasks that I was expected to do that I that were just like these Herculean tasks. They were just mm. like mammoth sized tasks that you just, you know, like how could anyone get that stuff done ever? Like having to write in a journal every single night. I was like, <sighs> and then you had to write an actual page, a full page every wow. night. Oh, however, however long it was, but I remember felt like a whole page if not if it, it wasn't yeah it did yeah and well no I think it was supposed to be a full page in wide ruled which is fine but I remember like at some point I started cutting pictures out and putting them in there so it would take <laughs> and I would it would take up some space <laughs> I recently you made found a collage them. <laughs> <laughs> I recently found them and she's like very creative, Megan, um, but that's not the task. <laughs> I was like, but it's the only way I can get it done. <laughs> or I would like start writing in really big handwriting because I yeah. just, it was just torturous to have to write that long. And I'm like, what am I going to write about? Like, I don't know. Like, I can barely keep track of my own thoughts, let alone like writing them down. So that was, it just, it always felt really hard and it always felt, I don't want to say rigged against me, but it did feel like if I was somebody else, it would be fine. I, it would be super easy and I'd be able to take care of everything. But because I was born with this stupid head of mine, you know, something was wrong with me. Hmm. I could just never like figure it out. I could never like get it together. Right. Like it just was always, I don't know, just always was hard. Always out of reach. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like everybody else seems to make it so easy. And everyone says, oh, it's just so easy. You just do da 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 da. And I'm like, that does not my existence. <laughs> and so when you're in that place on a daily basis as a kid, what does that do to you emotionally? Or what might that do have done to you emotionally? Do you still th- feel that way sometimes? Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I kind of teased it before, but it's my therapist makes really good money <laughs> because of it. <laughs> it took me to a pretty dark place. It was, what was the question again? Like, how did you say it? Well, I wondered kind of what it was like for you emotionally to always be perceiving that you were not getting your act together or getting it done or that goal, that task was always out of reach. The first word that's coming to mind is that it feels unjust Mm. because now I look at it and I'm like, gosh, I had the capability. I had the intelligence and because my way of processing the world was not stimulated and encouraged. I spent so many decades thinking that I was dumb Mm. and that I wasn't good enough and that I couldn't get my act together. And it still lingers to this day. I mean, I still struggle like looking at my messy bed right now. I'm like, gosh, if I just get my act together and put it away, like, why can't I just put it away? It's more than just putting something away. It's like there's there's all these tasks that are I'm looking at it and it's like there's things that need to happen. And so it's I think it's easy to put away the things that don't have other actions on them. So it's just like it. I overcomplicate things for sure. And so when you think about the feelings behind that, you're not I, I don't know how you said it. Did you say that you weren't, you, you needed to be somebody else's brain, first of all. You needed to be someone else. Mm-hmm. What does that do to a kid? I mean, that's just, I don't know. I'm having, I, I it's hard to even like conceive of what that might feel like to me sometimes. A feeling like the actual being of who I am is not enough or isn't valued. Yeah. No, that is, that is a consistent thing for me. I, I think what it does is it, there's no such thing as self-love at that point. Mm. Mm. And that is what it felt like. It felt like I had to be more mean to myself to combat the meanness that other people would do. People always say like, well, if you make a joke first about yourself, then people, other people can't make a joke about you. So I just didn't love myself. So when no one else loved me, it was fine. Mm. I didn't have any expectation that I would be loved or that I was lovable. When you say that, it it obviously hits me really hard because I do love you. Mm-hmm. 
what did that look like coming from me or coming from your family or coming from your friends to feel like you didn't didn't think that we loved you or that you weren't lovable? I think I separated the two things. So I knew that people loved me. I knew that you mm-hmm. loved me. It just felt very conditional. It mm-hmm. felt like for me anyways, my perception of it was that if I could just get my act together, if I could just get up on time and do these things, then the love would be consistent and that mm-hmm. I could feel the frustration in mm-hmm. others that I think when you're younger, you don't recognize that you can have multiple emotions and feelings happening at the same time. So mm-hmm. you can be frustrated with somebody and still love them. Right. And I just always thought that like, as soon as someone was frustrated with me, that was the end of it. And their love was gone in that moment. Mm. So it's really black and white for you. Yeah. For a very long time. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's because that emotion was just predominant? Like that was, it was coming out more and more forcefully or it was. I think it's easier to like our society seems like it's easier for people to be upset with each other. Like that's when we really communicate feelings about others. Mm -hmm. And we don't always talk about the good stuff. It took me decades to realize that people thought I was attractive I heard boys talking about other girls to me all the time but no one ever talked to me about me so if the only thing I'm ever hearing is other people I have no idea that anyone's interested in me Mm -hmm. and I think that's kind of what happened to me too is it like yes I had these these interesting things that occurred that happened to me and I know you guys did like the the carnival like I know you guys talked when it happened it was really cool or whatever kind of creative things I would be doing you know those things would pop up and they we would talk about them but I think the fact is like the deficit part the deficiency part was so every day that that Mm -hmm. was the majority of the conversation it was always like trying to fix me Mm -hmm. and fix the problems and that was the predominant I would say like probably 85 percent of the conversation was usually around that So there was conversation about good things, but it's just, it was drowned out by all the other things. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think as you're saying that, when you're saying the deficiency part, it sounds like it's also conflated in you being deficient versus there were, or fixing you versus fixing the symptoms or the issues that were going on. As an adult, I can look back and say, oh, this was an attempt to help fix the symptoms, but the way they were presented to me Mm-hmm. it felt like I had to fix me. It's one thing to say like you're wearing a pair of shoes that need to change, right? That's not you. They're, that's a shoe that's on top of you. But like when you're mm-hmm. talking about something in your brain, well, how, how do you differentiate when you're that young that this is not you? You know, it's like to me, it just felt like me. Yeah. And I don't think, at least from my perspective, I even understood what that meant. Yeah. Right. Like it seemed like, oh, it's just a skill you need to be able to learn and you haven't learned that skill yet. Yeah. And so then because of that, let's practice that skill again and again. And then realizing, well, you're one of the most brilliant people I know. If that's not sticking with you for whatever reason, then something else is going on. But we really had no language around that. Yeah. And it was so frustrating for people you and it was frustrating for the people who loved you but I can imagine I mean I know I didn't understand the emotional toll it was taking on you yeah I could see it with friends and stuff you know that you had difficulty sometimes making friends or keeping friends and I could see that I didn't really fully grasp what that meant within our family dynamic I don't think Mm. yeah I mean I it's it's a tough one because I felt very close to all of you guys. Like I felt like we had this tight knit bond. Mm -hmm. Family was revered and that was what we were raised with. But then there was also always this sense of like, I was just sort of out of reach. Like I I just would keep myself just out of arm's length and never really commit to anything Mm. because it was easier for me to not be such a disappointment. Mm. I hid a lot. I, I, I masked a lot. Like that's why I became a really good liar because it was so much easier to pretend that I wasn't who I was and to shut that person down than to actually own who I was. Hmm. Yeah. 
Just sitting with that for a minute. I think there's a sense from my perspective of it, of just trying to keep you going, keep you moving. And I, I think there was some fear in that from my point of view, that mm. if I couldn't keep you moving, that maybe you would just float away. Say more about that, because that's, that's interesting to me. When you were fourth or fifth grade, I remember coming home and you had stopped sleeping. You had mostly stopped eating. You had really dark circles under your eyes. You'd gotten very thin. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was worried about you, of course, never looking at it from the perspective of my contributions or lack thereof, you know, in, in what was going on. But I had been gone for a semester or so to college and, and I came back and I was really, really worried about you because I didn't, I didn't know what was going on exactly. I knew the school you were at was pretty brutal because I had gone there too, but I still had made friends and made the best of it. I was really happy to leave when I did, but I, I could see that you were kind of, I mean, that you were struggling for sure. And I remember when we got you out of that school and we got you to a new school where they had music and, and you really came alive and I think started this journey of healing because the brutality at that school at the original place was just so awful basically being told that you would never amount to anything right by a principal how yeah. wonderful is that being picked on by all the other kids and yeah but my answer to it was like let's get you to do your hair let's get you to like put on different clothes let's change you yeah right and I think that was sadly helpful on some level <laughs> because our society is so specifically you know but the the message behind it I think was horrible and that that somehow you not being enough w was the issue. Yeah. So with that, it was like, but like keeping, keeping you going, keeping you going to the next thing, not letting you wallow in that place, that really dark place. But I don't know that that was really true. We might've just been masking it. Yeah. I mean, the, the reality is like, I was still wallowing in it mm. and it was all, it was more covert at that point. Because I knew that I wasn't allowed to wallow in it and to express it. So I just mm -hmm. had to pretend that it didn't exist and move on. Mm -hmm. Chin up, carry carry on kind of thing. Yeah. And I and I will say, like, I see the idea of, hey, do your hair and these things. I see that I see the like the, the good rationale in it all. From my perspective, what I would have liked is if I had come to you guys and said, hey, I want to change this about myself. And it had been me saying, this is what I want to try. Or me saying, I want to try something different with my look. What do you recommend? But I think because it was presented as, hey, you need to, ch let's try changing this. It, it felt like, wait, I have to change myself to mm -hmm. fit in. Mm -hmm. And and then it got way more complicated. So I have to make jokes and I'm like, I don't make jokes. And, you know, I have to be funny and I'm like, I don't feel funny. And but it wasn't just you, like everybody in the house kind of had their idea of how to fix me and how to help me when when in reality, probably all I needed to hear was you are perfect just the way you are. And if they mm -hmm. don't like you, then they can go fuck themselves. <laughs> which I know you can't say yeah. to a five, a seven year old <laughs> or whatever, but that like that, that sentiment, right. That, that you, you are perfect. Like this is about them. This is not about you. And then when it's time for me, when I come to it saying, Hey, I need help in this. And I want to, I want to try something different Then it's, that's me individuating, right. That's me trying to figure out who I am at that point. Mm -hmm. But I think it was just because it was so early on, it really messed with me. A lot mm. yeah I'm so sorry that that I think was just so misguided right yeah I mean just so misguided and you were in fifth grade so you weren't seven you were hitting puberty and oh, but, uh, yeah but dad had started way earlier before. than you so you Got know it. like it, it had been starting since, since third grade hmm. <laughs> for all of my ADHD butts out there who need a break Now's your chance. Hit pause and come on back after you've done whatever you need to do to help yourself out. But if not, continue on. So when you think about this feeling of, we started talking about sort of this idea of underachievement. And I think part of that is this idea that I'm not becoming this perfect daughter or perfect female or perfect whatever 
right, we needed to become. Do you feel like there's things, if we're like digging into that a little bit more, that you've done to help yourself with that? I mean, you say kind of jokingly, right, that the therapist has gotten a lot of money out of it, but what might you have been doing for yourself in order to be able to kind of, I don't know if combat it is the right word or if it's acknowledge it and, and move through it or. I think it has been, at least so far, it's been a 10 year journey. Mm. And I think that's the challenge of it is that it doesn't just fix itself right away. Mm -hmm. and that even if it doesn't fix itself right away it's okay and you just keep growing and growing each day right you it's like the onion Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you peel one layer off and there's another stinky layer underneath and you just gotta keep peeling that onion and not give up on yourself I think also just talking to you guys about it and not masking it anymore that was a huge I think I couldn't anymore my body literally just physically gave up at one point because it was like Mm -hmm. I I couldn't hold it in any longer and being okay with the fact that I might lose friends and family in order Mm -hmm. to take care of myself. And I'm sure we'll talk about this at some point, but like I had to do prolonged treatment and I wasn't sure if I was going to have a relationship with you afterwards. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if you were going to accept it. And I wasn't sure if I was going to, you know, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And I was terrified of that idea because I love you. And I like was so worried that, if I really showed my my true self, that Mm -hmm. somehow you wouldn't like it. And that's nothing that you did, right? That's just like what it turned into for me. And so I think that just having having those hard conversations, I was lucky that you wanted to continue (laughs) hanging out with me. And And I think you said something to me at one point. I had missed Thanksgiving or something one year. It was like that first time where it was like I was saying no and it was it felt like every I was going to ruin Thanksgiving and and that's just how I felt about it. And I think I don't know if it was that point or was maybe another time when I did come and I didn't want to come and you were just like I, I appreciate it when you tell me that you're not able to come because you are such a phenomenal person when you are here. Mm-hmm. If you're here when you don't want to be here, it's palpable. You know, it's, you admit. And so whatever it is you're feeling internally, you admit, admit, emit. So like Mm -hmm. if I'm upset, I admit that feeling. And I remember that being like such a pivotal moment for me. It gave me permission to say, what am I feeling? How am I feeling? Mm -hmm. Because if I'm not paying attention to this, like I am affecting the people around me. Yeah. And I think that the regulating of emotions is something that I've been reading more about that was very unclear to me growing up. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand that. I think you've said to me at some point, if I'm feeling something at a level 10, you're feeling it at a level 100. And so you have this immense ability to feel and also to emote those emotions. And and you are such a high achiever. Like you are somebody who you've gotten your master's degree, you've been a professor, you've done shows, you've made movies, you've obviously you're you're the one producing this entire podcast. So you are such a high achiever. And I can only imagine how sort of that not mapping on. I mean, this kid who at the same time does a carnival, that's you, Mm -hmm. puts on this thing is kind of withering on the vine at school. And somehow for us and for me specifically, I can't speak for everybody, but for me to not see that connection feels like such a missed opportunity, you know, and such a missed Mm -hmm. moment. And so caused you so much pain that the place that you're supposed to feel safest, right? The, The place you're supposed to feel home didn't feel safe always. And And I know that I contributed to that. I also know and have understood that I was a child too. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so I'm not going to take it to the point of not recognizing that. But I do think for parents too, that there's just not enough information and help out there. And so you're trying to help and your version of help could be really damaging actually. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know, I know that it all came from a good place. That's the reason why I think that I was able to work through a lot of this is that it wasn't from a place of malice, whereas I know mm-hmm. other people, they had a lot of malice in their life. Mm-hmm. So I think it was 
the saving grace for me on some level. But yeah, I think it's it's really easy to think like, hey, I think I'm doing this good thing for you, right? Like my dog, mm-hmm. I think that I'm giving her some human food and that's a good thing because I'm giving her real food. If it's a, a raisin or an onion or now for her chicken, like it's actually deadly to her. Right. And it's not with the intention that I want to harm her, but like it's just knowledge. And I think we just don't talk about the day to day enough. We don't talk about like strategies. It's all about like we're trying to we've had to spend time learning about this ADHD thing. Yeah. And acknowledging that it even exists in adults for (laughs) crying out loud. So it's just been like trying to convince people that it's real. That's what we've been doing for like the last decade, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And now it's like we just need to find a safe place to be able to strategize about how to work with these kids so that you do feel like you have home and that you can be more receptive to what they need because it's totally different than what a neurotypical brain needs. Totally different. Yeah. Yeah. And let's just be clear, too, not just kids, but middle-aged kids. It's true. (laughs) Anybody. And when you're saying it, I know that I feel it deeply that I've had to learn. And I feel like this learning has helped me in my parenting so much and really having to be curious and having to listen. And I think that's what I didn't do well at all. I saw I was good at observing. I was good at making recommendations and let's try this and let's try that strategies but they were strategies that were unattainable for you and were never going to work for you and I I love it to this day you know so I'll make what about and you'll go no and I go (laughs) okay you know you know and so it's really about listening to you and and seeing you and and hopefully helping you to feel heard because you are exactly perfect exactly the way you are and i been trying really hard to remember that on this podcast even that we need to do it in a way that works for both of us yeah it can't just work for one of us and I have to learn sometimes you have to learn too but I have to learn how my brain works you have to learn how my brain works I have to learn how your brain works and coming from that place feels really doable when we're curious and we're asking questions about it because then it doesn't become a judgment. It just becomes this, huh, let's experiment and try this out and see what works. And then nobody has to fit into anybody else's cookie mold, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I even recognize that like, I know it may not sound like it, Michelle, but there are times that I am limiting myself from saying things. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I know for sure it does not say, feel that way, but yeah, I, I do catch myself at times like saying, okay, don't just stop, Megan, just stop. Yeah. But it it's also just feels so freeing to like have someone who's actually listening. Mm. And so I just want to keep talking because I'm like, no one's ever listened to me like this, please. <laughs> da, da, da. I got to get it all out before she stops listening. You know, and it's like, <laughs> oh, Okay, we're on episode, what, 20 now, 20, Mm -hmm. however many it is we're now. And yeah, it's like, okay, so she's going to continue to be here. But it's part of it's just kind of learning to accept the fact that it's changed Mm -hmm. and that a person can can grow and be different. And and so then having to just trust in that, because like for so long, I just never trust like I didn't feel like I had it. And so now I have it. I'm like the fire hydrant. What is that analogy when it's like? You drinking have, out of a fire hydrant. Yeah, yeah, drinking out of a fire hydrant. And so it's like, okay, it's there. We just have to trust in it and it'll come back. And I think one of the strategies I've seen you use, if I can speak for you for a moment, my observation of what I've seen is you've asked for it more, what you need. And I think yeah. you've been more clear about what you've needed and you've done a lot of work to get there. But I've seen you do it with your family. I've seen you do it with Brian. I've seen you do it with friends. And having to advocate for yourself so clearly as to what you need. And that's hard when you've been put down your whole life and told that who you are fundamentally, as you said it, isn't okay. It's no, I am okay. I'm exactly fine, exactly as I am. And I deserve to be heard. I deserve to be treated well, even if this or that doesn't happen the exact way that someone else thinks it should. I deserve to be here. Yeah. And and to be present. And just trusting you, trusting myself Mm. and trusting the fact that if something does happen, I can repair it. If I do mess up, I'm really good at repairing. 
Oh gosh, you're the best. And I and think you're the like, best at taking, I just interrupted you, sorry, but you're the best okay. at taking feedback. You really are. Well, and yeah. I think for so long, like I've been so scared to speak up because I believe that if I spoke up and said what I really needed, then I would lose everybody. Because again, it would be showing who I really am and that wasn't good. And But then it's this vicious cycle because what I ended up doing was that I would try to pretend like that wasn't me, but it really was. And it was kind of, again, undeniable at times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I've been trying it out. Like last night, right? I called you and it was a powerful day, mm-hmm. but it was also a very exhausting day for me. Mm-hmm. And I just <laughs> I was like, I need a glass of wine, <laughs> maybe two. <laughs> <laughs> and we had talked about meeting today and and so I called you with like my little flush red cheeks and I'm like hi ah, guess what I did tonight <laughs> just a heads up I don't know if it's gonna change me tomorrow but I wanted you to be aware <laughs> it was cute yeah and I appreciated it because it does help to know what's coming sometimes yeah for sure even like getting ready today and and we were gonna meet around noon and then I was like oh I'm just kind of looking at the time like no I need I need 12 30 and then I get to 12 30 and I'm like ah, oh, I'm still maybe I want to curl my hair a little bit okay I'm gonna curl my hair and that's why I'm just trying to keep you in the loop at least you know okay yes it's taking me a while but I'm at least hopefully trying to keep you in the loop I didn't keep you in the loop though about the fact that my computer died <laughs> so that was that was the one thing I was like ah, oh, I should have uh, yeah no problem I think when we talk about this whole concept though of feeling like you're not meeting the needs or underachieving something I think you just brought up something brilliant which is keeping people in the loop because the hiding piece of it due to the I'm guessing like the feeling of shame that you you yet again didn't meet whatever expectation somebody is expecting of you or maybe even you were expecting of yourself yeah and one thing I think I've seen shift is that you aren't angry with yourself as often internally, it seems. And so in accepting who you are and accepting that that's going to happen and that you just have to, unfortunately or fortunately, give yourself 30 extra minutes to get to anywhere on time or because you're going to forget the keys and that you've given yourself that strategy of letting people know. So at least you're not coming into a wall of what the heck, Megan, what's going on? And I think that's huge. Well, I think that that's the piece where self-love has really Mm -hmm. shifted a lot of that because I didn't love myself. I shut it down and I I locked little Rosie and uh, Tallulah Jones. I locked, those are my inner children. I locked them away. And And Rosie's Rosie's the little one and Tallulah Jones is middle school. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, sorry. Well, Rosie Didn't mean to interrupt, my, but <laughs> Rosie's my three year old self who doesn't like who likes to show off her Care Bear underwear. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> Tallulah Jones is like the middle schooler who's just like super angsty and like, I am just amazing. You know, she, those are the two. And I emotionally locked them away and suppressed them. And I, I had to go through a lot of repairing with them and apologizing to myself as an adult saying, You did not deserve that. You are such lovely amazing, incredible human beings. And it was easier for a while to like talk about it, you, you know, like Mm -hmm. Rosie, you and Tallulah, you. And it was, so it kind of separated me a little bit from them. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until I had to like realize that, wait, I am Rosie. I am Tallulah. That was a big shift for me. And Mm -hmm. actually saying to myself, I love myself. Like that's something that, gosh, four years ago, I couldn't do. And I think that's where all the anger came from. It's just, I just didn't love myself. It, it's such an important thing to figure out how to honor yourself and honor the, the the inner children and honor the uniqueness of yourself. But I, I had to say it over and over again. There were nights mm-hmm. like where I couldn't sleep and I'm like, I am smart enough. I am lovable. And I would actually start off by saying like, you're lovable, you're smart, you're talented. And then I realized, no, I need to be saying I, because you is still keeping me at an arm's length. I'm lovable. I'm smart. And I would just say it over and over and over again in my head. Hmm. I had had it said the opposite for so long that like it just was going to take a while. To let it sink in. Yeah, to let it overwrite that, that tape that I had in my head. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Well, thanks for being open, 
also to talk about like what's happened in the past. Yeah. And I don't hold you responsible for that, you know, but like, I'm sure it must be really difficult to hear me talk about it. And I appreciate you being vulnerable enough to say, ah, I I played a part in this and I'm not going to like carry it around like a badge of a warrior badge or whatever. But like, you're just to say like, yeah, I, I see that. And I'm glad that things have changed. Yeah. And I think knowing better, doing better when you can, not that you're not going to make similar mistakes again because you are who you are to some degree but yeah to be open to that shift and I'm curious if there's other people listening that might also have experiences like this because this idea that you're not living up to you're not getting your quote-unquote act together it means so many things in different parts of our life and so if you're thinking oh it's just your kid dealing with this at school that isn't true, right? Because every part of your life requires executive functioning. We keep talking about making an ADHD-friendly podcast and having intermission and things like that and breaks, you know, such an important part of it. And I I just curious if other people have had these experiences similar and and what they might have found. And that idea of self-love, I mean, I think we can all take that on whatever your challenges are, whatever your limitations are. We all have them. Yeah. And I would challenge also those who love people with ADHD or who love a person where you recognize someone in your life who can never quite get their act together. Mm. Right. Because I'm sure that there's people who are listening who can like pinpoint that person right now in their mind. Mm -hmm. I I would challenge you to reach out to them and maybe just ask, hey, how does this feel for you when I do this or just start that hard conversation and it's amazing like what can come from it even just reaching out to them and saying hey how you doing like really how are you doing and listen Mm -hmm. and be curious about them because you were saying like keeping me from a really dark place and just keeping me moving Mm -hmm. the thing that I think I needed more than anything was just for someone to listen yeah And to really listen and repeat back to me what they were hearing me say and to not force me in any one way, just to listen. I agree. And I think that's the hardest part when you see somebody you love. And I think a lot of people who have ADHD can get to pretty dark places, understandably. (laughs) If everything you're trying to do doesn't feel like you can quite get it done or others are perceiving that about you and even telling you that I can understand that but it's that's a tough one to sit with that depth of that emotion when maybe you yourself don't have capacity for that so I think it's also really important if you are loving somebody who's got ADHD and you're struggling with that is to get help because the whole family the whole unit anybody connected you need sometimes it's helpful to have people who are trained that can help you walk through that with them so that yeah. you learn some skills, they learn some skills, and and you have a common language together. It is a very important thing to have common vocabulary. Absolutely. I love you so much. Thanks for talking and being vulnerable today. I love you too. Thanks for listening. Love you. Love you. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Sisters, Sisters. This series has us focusing more specifically on ADHD and all of its symptoms. And we're doing a deep dive into a list that we got from the book, Driven to Distraction. If you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoy laughing with each other, please share it with someone you think would benefit from the conversation. Make sure to follow us on whatever platform you're currently listening to so that you can get notified each week because next week we're going to be talking about chronic procrastination and the fear that you won't do it right. Now I have so many thoughts that I'm afraid to say because they may not come out well. So I'm going to wait for Michelle to keep me on track, but until then here's to a great end of the week. And remember, stay curious. Be the Zen Buddha, Michelle. Be the Zen Buddha. You be the crazy. Bring it on, Megan. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready.